Uh, so thanks so much, Greg, for inviting me. Um, uh, let me start. I'll just say a word about the University of Chicago Crime Lab. We started this 10 years ago uh, in Chicago after a doctoral student at the University of Chicago got shot and killed a block off campus, which led to a lot of soul searching at the University of Chicago about how we can be more helpful to the city. And so we've been doing various things in an attempt to be helpful. I want to, in particular, thank uh, Chief Lewin from Chicago PD, who's here. Uh, he and the police department in general have been uh, great partners in you know, what we've been trying to do with the city for the last 10 years. So thank you very much. Um, the particular project that I'm going to talk about starts with this uh, massive increase in gun violence that we saw in Chicago in 2016, which was nearly instantaneous. At the end, you know, through December 2015, you wouldn't have expected you wouldn't have thought anything was different in Chicago. And then um, we had this 60% increase in shootings and homicides, which, you know, if you're talking about uh, Alexandria, Virginia, 60% change isn't such a big deal. That's like, you know, five to seven or whatever, five to eight, whatever the, five to eight, I guess it would be. In a city of 2.7 million people, this is incredibly rare when you look at the UCR data going back decades leads to questions about what the city should do. So one possibility would be you could wait for the federal government to uh, change gun laws. Uh, you may or may not want to hold your breath for that. Uh, different sort of thing, there's a huge uh, interest in the city of Chicago because so much of the gun violence is concentrated in the most economically disadvantaged parts of the city, a huge interest in thinking about social policy solutions to the gun violence problem. If you look at the data on who's uh, involved both as offenders and victims in gun violence, you see the majority are men over the age of 20. If you think about the way that social policy is designed in the United States, it's mostly to care for women, children, and the elderly. And so there's a fundamental sort of mismatch between what social policy in the United States is set up to do and where the needs are to use social policy to lever to reduce gun violence. And so the city has been trying to, the city basically had to generate resources from scratch from the philanthropic community and build a bunch of social service capacity that didn't previously exist to address the gun violence problem. And so that was, it was clear in 2016 that that was going to be a medium term project at its most rapid. And so to the extent to which the city had anything that it could be doing in a very quick turnaround sort of way, it had to do with the police department. And so uh, uh, the research center that I helped run, the crime lab, partnered with the Chicago Police Department, the mayor's office, and Sean Malinowski, who at the time I think was chief of staff to Charlie Beck at LEPD, to set up um, strategic decision support centers, which I think about these basically as, uh, you know, tech-assisted or data-driven management changes in some of the most violent districts. So let me just explain what these are um, uh, for a minute. So, you know, my sense of big police departments in the United States right now is they are more or less uh, all playing uh, off of the same, all using the same playbook. So if you, like, look at the National Academy of Sciences' recent report on proactive policing, uh, you know, proactive, you could define this in different ways, but if you look at the National Academy of, report, uh, of Sciences report about proactive policing, they describe it as worrying about high risk, concentrating resources on high risk places, high risk people, and community engagement. And that's certainly the strategy that the Chicago PD has in place as well. Um, and I think in some ways the innovation with the SDSCs is not a fundamental change in strategy, but sort of a change in the way that that strategy is implemented uh, in different ways. And so you can see this by thinking about initially what the status quo is uh, in the operations at the Chicago Police Department. So um, Chief Lewin's shop has uh, designed a very nice custom mapping software called Caboodle um, that you know, let's officers go online and look at recent crime patterns in the area that they're patrolling. Uh, standard operating procedure at the Chicago PD has been traditionally in most districts to largely rely on individual officer initiative 
to make use of the crime mapping software. And I think you know, this is surely not unique to the Chicago PD that doesn't get used maybe quite as often as we would ideally like. Um, and the deployment plans that local commanders have, like where people should be spending their time, tend to be fairly static. Uh, in contrast, under the Strategic Decision Support Centers now, there is a dedicated crime analyst. So when these originally started, we had someone from the crime, a civilian from the crime lab, go in and uh, embed themselves in a district and do a lot of the crime analysis and then push it out. So you're not relying on the initiative of individual officers. And we would do things like um, uh, the commanders then, with uh, analysts' help, would then come up with dynamic plans. So what do we think is going on? Let's come up with a plan and then let's evaluate this every day as we go to see how it's going and make adjustments. Um, the other thing that they would do is, so uh, you know, the second sort of plank of proactive policing is focusing on high risk persons. Uh, the department obviously knows uh, who has an open warrant. Uh, the, Government writ large knows who's on probation, parole. In principle, they know who's at high risk as well. And what the SDSCs involve basically is trying to push that information out more effectively, especially to the TAC teams who have the flexibility to do more proactive policing. I'll just skip through this in the interest of time. And then um, many of you probably know that the Chicago Police Department, the third plank of proactive policing is community engagement. Chicago was one of the innovators in this area starting in the 1990s with this uh, Chicago Alternative Policing Strategy, the CAPS program. And I think it's fair to say that that is maybe less energetically implemented now than it was when it first began. Um, and so one of the things that we saw some of the SDSC districts doing is in some sense kind of expanding the dashboard that they pay attention to in terms of what officers are looking at. So instead of just looking at arrests and guns confiscated and drugs confiscated, sort of standard policing measures like that, some of the commanders would start paying attention to things like positive community interactions. Okay. Um, so the way that the SDSCs were rolled out was very much with the public safety crisis in the city in mind. So this is a map of the city of Chicago. Hyde Park is actually right here. This is the downtown loop area. This is Navy Pier. The two most violent districts in the city of Chicago, um, at least in you know, 2016, 2017, were Englewood on the south side of the city, District 7, and uh, the Harrison District, which is essentially Garfield Park on the west side of the city, along the 290 Heroin Highway leading out of downtown to the suburbs. So obviously, as Chicago PD is thinking about where they should prioritize this, 7 and 11 are the two obvious districts that you would do this in. So they, uh, together, these two districts accounted for about a quarter of all homicides in the city. Um, there, I think the department and the crime lab originally had fantasies of being able to then think about future districts in a very deliberate, kind of thoughtful way. I think someone uh, showed then Mayor Emanuel some very, very preliminary results, said, this sounds awesome, let's do another six <laughs> next, like right now. Uh, so in the next month, um, it expanded to another four districts, you can see here, that are not quite as violent as District 7 and 11, but nearly as violent. Um, so obviously, you know, uh, when you're in the middle of a public safety crisis as in 2016, you're not going to do a randomized experiment. You can see that in some sense the districts are prioritized for SDCs in descending order of risk, but with 22 districts in the city, you're not doing a reg uh, regression discontinuity estimate. And so what we're going to do instead is, um, you know, what is increasingly becoming sort of standard practice in the social sciences for place-based interventions, which is synthetic controls, which is a 
powerful tool, but then you know the implementation in particular settings gets complicated, and I'll talk a little bit about. I'm sure they discuss it well as well. Some of the complications. I don't have time to get into the details. What's that? I don't have time to get into the details. Oh, perfect. Okay. Um, <laughs> that's great. That's great. So let me, if you're not familiar with synthetic controls, let me give you a, just a little bit of a, a little bit of intuition. You know, if you sort of think about a standard difference in difference design, I'm using the economics uh, sort of intuition. It's like you're comparing trends in a, a, a jurisdiction that gets an intervention. So before intervention to after are trends in the place that gets the intervention with some sort of comparison jurisdiction. Um, and then uh, sort of the uh, identifying assumption for that is that they would have had parallel trends in the outcome absent the intervention. And synthetic controls, in some sense, kind of forces the action. So it's taking a treatment jurisdiction and then being deliberate about what comparison areas you're using by trying to pick places that have similar levels and trends during the pre-period. So you're trying to, you know, if Y1, if um, the, you know, up through period capital T is the pre-period, this is your treatment jurisdiction. You're looking for a weighted average of the outcomes in candidate comparison areas that are as similar as possible during the pre-period. And you know, if you sort of think about uh, the process, the, the sort of the underlying data generating process as the outcome y is a function of f of x, which is like the true structure of what drives crime in an area, plus e, idiosyncratic noise, the challenge with synthetic controls is we want to find comparison areas that are similar with respect to the underlying structure of the violence problem, f of x, and not match on noise. And so that's where a lot of the sort of the statistics and the, the data science come in and trying to do this in practice. Um, and, you know, how do you then do this sort of matching in a world in which you don't know what are the noise donors and what are the, what are the places that actually share the structure? And so, you know, the, the logic of synthetic controls, the way that this is, this technique is developing is essentially to uh, use different ways of making it harder to assign weight to any donor uh, as a way to sort of filter out noise donors um, with the hope that that helps you prioritize those candidate donors, those, ca those donors, those jurisdictions that would uh, contribute data to the comparison, the synthetic comparison area that are actually similar with, with respect to signal rather than uh, with respect to noise. And so Alberto Abadi, then at the Kennedy School, now at MIT, um, was uh, developed uh, the approach. And you know, the idea that they originally had in mind was to basically fix, impose some pre-existing constraints on the weights. Right? One is that they should be non-negative, and the other is that they should sum to one. And um, that turns out to not necessarily always work in every setting. And so just if you think about a criminal justice application and you're thinking about the possibility of displacement, for instance, non-negative you know, non weights doesn't necessarily make sense. And if you think that you've got areas that have unusually high crime rates, for instance, some weights that sum to one forces you toward, uh, to just do interpolation and doesn't let you do sort of any extrapolation, which can uh, make uh, synthetic controls more difficult. And so there have been uh, refinements to the approach done over time and sort of the basic intuition is to do some machine learning like things that adaptively use the data to impose some constraints on the, on the weights. Okay, and that's what we're going to wind up doing ourselves here. Okay, so how does this look in um, how does this look in the Chicago application? So I'm just going to talk this through within the context of Englewood District 7, which to preview is the district where we wound up seeing the largest impact of the SDSCs. So we've got 16 non-SDSC districts that are candidate donors around the city. And so one problem that you see originally is, you know, here's the shooting incidents per month by district in 2016, Englewood's clearly an outlier, right? And so if I'm using sort of the initial synthetic control method where the weights, the sum of the weights is constrained to one, I'm out of luck. So 
and you can see, so uh, this is the actual, this is quarterly shooting data now for Engelblood up to when we implemented the STSCs in February 2017. This dashed red line here is the synthetic control that you get when you use sort of the standard synthetic control method that imposes these rigid uh, constraints on the weights. And you can see you fit pretty terribly in advance. Okay. Um, so one initial half step that you can take in the direction of addressing that problem is by noticing that you've got data at more finely grained levels of resolution than just the district. You have data, crime data at the beat level. And you can see if you, so now each, I don't even know what, would you call that salmon? I don't know what color you would call that. Um, so whatever color this is, these are the beat shooting incidents per 100,000 in the city of Chicago. And you can see within the beat distribution, District 7 is no longer quite as much an outlier, but you can see it's, I mean, this is quite shocking itself, right? That the, um, but you can see that District 7 is still really high up in the, in the beat level distribution. So you use the fixed weights, you now allow uh, combinations of beats to be candidate donors. You start to fit better during the pre-period, but you still have some problems. And then if you take sort of the next step, you allow aggregates of beats to be candidate donors, like pseudo districts, and you use the data adaptively to uh, impose constraints on the weights for the comparison area. Now you can see you're starting to fit quite well during the pre-period. So what do you see during the post-period then in District 7 and Englewood for shootings? You can see that there's a 34% reduction in shootings in, the, in District 7 <coughs> Englewood compared to the synthetic control, which is a really big, uh, a really big change, right? Um, so there's a different, how am I doing on time, Greg? Uh, okay. Am I okay? Um, so then there's a, uh, there's a different sort of statistical challenge here, which is um, how to think about doing inference with the synthetic control. And so the way that you normally do inference with the synthetic control is, you know, you want to know what is the distribution of synthetic control, quote, effects under the null hypothesis where there's nothing there. And so the way that we normally do this is that we basically generate a synthetic control estimate for all of the different control jurisdictions and then look at the distribution. So if you're a control jurisdiction, you have no intervention effect mechanically, and then I can look at the distribution of treatment effects and that tells me something about what that should look like under the null uh, hypothesis of no effect. Problem is we only have 16 non-SDSC districts in the city of Chicago. And so that gives you a very kind of, you know, very limited number of possible p-values that you could have. Um, so this doesn't seem totally ideal. And so what we basically do instead for inference is we create pseudo candidate districts by bootstrapping um, pseudo districts at the beat level. Okay, so then we can sort of fill in the placebo distribution of, uh, of effects. And so this is similar to um, this paper by Robbins, Saunders, and, uh, and Kilmer that, uh, uh, that was also, I think, a, I think a, a RAM paper too, right? Um, okay. Greg's original code. What's that? And Greg's original code. And Greg's original code, okay. <laughs> sure, let's make this all about Greg. That's great. <laughs> um, so here's what you see for, here's what you see, uh, I think that this is for, uh, for shootings. So the, Gray distribution here is the null distribution of treatment effects. Um, and you can see for most of the SDSC districts, the actual intervention effect that you see falls within the sort of the mass of the placebo distribution. And you can see District 7 is clearly the outlier here. Now, since this is the ASA, you're probably thinking, well, this feels like cheating. You've done a bunch of different tests. And so then the other thing that we can do is we can adjust the p-values for each of the SDSC districts for multiple testing. And District 7, that 34% reduction in shootings is statistically significant even when you account for the fact that we're doing this six different times for each of the districts. 
If you look at homicide rates, this goes back to the previous RAND presentation. You have uh, there are many more shootings than homicides. Uh, so our statistical power, once you adjust for the number of tests, is a little bit more attenuated. But you know, this, this highlights the power problems with uh, synthetic controls and rare outcomes, where you have a 62% reduction in homicides, and the uh, adjusted p-value is 0.12. So okay. Um, the, the next thing that I, I think sort of the, the last segment of the talk that I wanted uh, to spend a minute talking through is what the mechanisms are, right? Because, you know, this is, uh, homicide has, homicide and shootings have declined in Chicago since, steadily since 2016. But, you know, I can tell you as someone who lives on the south side of Chicago in Hyde Park, they are still way too common. Uh, in the three weeks a year that we get decent weather in Chicago, uh, we like to sleep with our windows open in Hyde Park. And, you know, the sound of gunfire from the Woodlawn neighborhood just south of the Midway, we live right on the boundary between, is, you know, it's sirens and shootings as a regular occurrence on the south side of Chicago still. Um, so everyone in the city, we'd like to know what it is about District 7 that was so effective so that we could uh, spread that to the other districts, the other SDSC districts and the other districts more generally. Okay, so what's behind the improvement? So one hypo natural hypothesis that you might have had, so there's a, there's a literature in the economics of crime that uses different natural experiments to look at the effects of putting additional police resources on the street. And my interpretation of that literature is that it pretty consistently suggests that if you just put more officers out, crime goes down, and it looks like arrests go down as well. So it looks like more police on the street has some sort of preventive effect on crime. We can, I know that's inconsistent with the criminology literature, we can have a comedy, uh, uh, conversation about that. But that led us to the initial hypothesis of maybe the Chicago Police Department is understandably flooding the zone in District 7 and District 11. That doesn't seem to be the case. So thanks to Chief Lewin, we have different measures of police officer presence in districts, and we don't see an increase in, uh, in police resources around the time of the SDSC implementation. A different hypothesis that you might have is um, that the police just came in and arrested everyone. Um, <laughs> And you, you laugh, but I've, uh, I have a very good friend who is a lieutenant of the Chicago Police Department now who used to work on what was called the SOS team, the Special Operations, I don't know what the S stands for. Uh, special Operations Section. Section. I should have gotten section. So, he, so SOS is disbanded, but he told me back in the day when they were on SOS, the strategy basically was gun violence is, uh, is flaring up on this block basically go in and arrest everyone. This, this is by his accounting. This is not me sort of saying this. So we thought in principle, maybe that's what's going on here, even though the SES, SOS unit has been disbanded, but you don't see an increase in total arrests in the district. Okay, so it's not that. And so then that leads to a third hypothesis. Is what's going on a change in tactics in, um, uh, in, in District 7? So one of the things that we can do for starters is we can look at the gun arrest rate in, uh, in District 7 compared to its synthetic control. And you can see that the number of gun arrests is going up by about 18%. So this is not quite statistically significant. I think the p-value is something like 0 0.12, 0 0.15, something like that. But it's certainly suggestive of a sizable increase in gun arrests. And so if you think about what's happening, if, if the delta in total arrests, or if the treatment effect on total arrests is roughly zero, and there is an 18% increase in gun arrests, police are displacing other sorts of arrests for gun arrests, which I think if you, if you believe that gun violence is the main public safety challenge in a city like Chicago, which I think you know, there's a lot of data behind that view, this is a, sort of a refocus of police attention in a way that is sort of socially productive, all, holding all else equal. The other thing that you can see is, you know, uh, one of the things that the SDSCs do, as I mentioned, is they're doing a, uh, more to push out information 
of who's at high risk for violence involvement, who has an open warrant. And you can see that there's a statistically significant 32% increase in warrant arrests. Again, holding total arrests constant, this is showing that the police are changing what they're doing. And let me just show you a third picture here. I think the scale here is not necessarily ideal, uh, ideal but this is a graph of recorded positive community interactions. Okay, so it's possible that what's going on is a change in police recording practices rather than a change in police behavior. We're trying to sort of think of different ways with the data that we have to, uh, to dig into that. So let me caveat that uh, at the outset. But this dashed vertical line here is when the SDSCs went into effect in District 7. The University of Chicago maroon trend line here is the number of recorded positive community interactions in Englewood. The gray line here is the number of recorded positive community interactions in the other SDSC districts. And you can see that one way in which Englewood was a real outlier. So Englewood was an outlier both with respect to changes in gun arrests and, and open warrant arrests, but also with respect to increases in positive community interactions. And so to the extent to which this outlier feature of Englewood might be part of the story, the encouraging news is that in the other SDSC districts, you've been seeing an increase in positive recorded interactions over time. And so I think the hopeful scenario would be if this is part of the active ingredient for District 7, if that's diffusing to other districts, maybe the effectiveness of the SDSCs will be diffusing as well. Okay. Um, so, you know, uh, there's a, a literature in economics uh, that is uh, looking at the effects of management practices on firms, right? So one of the big puzzles in economics has been, why are there consulting companies? Um, <laughs> Because, you know, it's like uh, sort of the standard economic view of the world is that you have a company, you have this insane incentive to be profit maximizing. How can it be that you have a bunch of companies that are operating in some suboptimal way where they would then like be in a position to go hire, pay a, a million dollars to KPMG or Boston Consulting Group or whatever to come in and tell you how to do your thing better? Like, how does that persist? And yet it seems to be the case that in the private sector, even in very competitive sectors, like providing firms with management consulting advice causes them to operate more efficiently. So even private sector firms are operating below what economists would call the production possibility frontier. And so maybe it's not surprising that the same thing could be true for public sector agencies as well. And I think that that's one way, you know, there were some uh, some tech build out here as well to complement these management changes. Let me like, talk about that in one second. But one sort of lesson here is that one way that you can improve public safety in these cities, which is especially useful in cities that are very resource constrained, is to think harder about the management of these organizations so that you get more output from a given level of, from a given level of, uh, of inputs which you know, is a hugely important lesson for the city of Chicago because I think that we are dead last or dead first, depending on how you think about it, in terms of unfunded pension obligations in the United States. And the state of Illinois is dead last or dead first in terms of unfunded pension obligations in the United States at the state level. And so we are in a very, very resource constrained environment. And so anything that we can do to get more output, holding inputs constant, I think is very, very welcome. Um, now, and it's not because of the tech build, it's not literally technically true that there was no additional resources put into these districts. But just to give you a flavor of this, um, our, so Chief Lewin might have a different cost estimate, but sort of our back of the envelope cost estimate was like the tech build and putting in the, uh, like amortizing the cost of the tech build over like a five year period and the costs of an analyst and like whatever else. You know, you're looking at something like, you know, call it $2 million per SDSC district. So $12 million maybe sounds like a lot of money, but CPD's overall budget is something like $1.5 billion. 
So it's basically like the additional resources are like a rounding error. Here's another way to think about it is <laughs> Phil Cook and I did a book back in 2000 that estimated that the social costs for each gunshot wounding in, the, uh, in America, the social harms from that are about a million dollars per gunshot injury, right? So even if the only district that ever benefits from the entire SDSC citywide program is Englewood, a 34% reduction in shootings in Englewood alone easily makes this thing hugely beneficial, maybe not quite as beneficial as parks, um, but still remarkably beneficial from a cost-benefit perspective. Thank you very much.